um, back health. Um, very excited for the series to start. Um, you'll be getting emails about other talks that will be coming up, and they're going to be going to be wonderful. Um, so, as I said, our first series this morning is on back health, and I'd like to introduce Susan Senjay and Rebecca Charita, um, our speakers for this morning. Thank you. Hello. One more thing: please hold your questions until the end. Okay, there'll be a 10 to 15 minute Q and A at the very end. Thank you and enjoy. Okay, hi, good morning. I'm glad you all found the right room. I'm Susan Sanji. Okay, so um, I was really excited when we had this brainstorm to do the Ask the Expert series and what was going to be the first topic and I was immediately back pain, back health. Not just because of years and years of training. I started uh, in fitness in 1991 and then became a trainer in 95 and um, I was fortunate enough to have begun my career at UCLA in the outpatient physical therapy um, program. And so I learned a lot working alongside the therapist. I was kind of the person that you went to when you were too healthy for physical therapy, but you still had no idea what to do in the weight room and you didn't want to hurt yourself again. So that's how I got my start. And um, that's really where my emphasis on movement was formed that first you must move well, and then you can move more, right? Then you can add miles, then you can add strength, but if you don't move well first, and you don't have an awareness of the details, you could cause more harm. So that's really what this is all about today. Um, let's see. Okay, we click this side. Okay. Um, some facts about back pain. You probably already know a lot of this information. Low back pain is the single leading cause of disability worldwide, according to the Global Burden of Disease 2010. Probably not changed very much in 2017. One half of all working Americans admit to having back pain symptoms every single year. And what we know about back pain is often it's not the traumatic accident. Sometimes it can be from a car accident or something. But oftentimes it's the wear and tear. Sometimes we don't even know why we have back pain and that's one of the reasons why we're here today. But why do I personally care about back pain? Why is it a passion of mine? Um, there's my mom. That's my mom and my dad. And um, my dad was in the Navy in submarines and he was gone quite a lot. So my mom was alone with all of us. I'm the youngest. And I have my earliest memories of her on the sofa in back pain crying because she had to still get up, she had to still take care of all of us, get us to school, and she was in debilitating, excruciating back pain. Out of nowhere, it seemed. Um, she hadn't done anything different. She used to be incredibly athletic. She was a gymnast, she played volleyball, which she was too short to play, but whatever, she was good at jumping. And all, all the way up to my, what, before my sister was born. I mean, she was crazy. And then she would get this back pain, and she was so afraid of getting it, it shrank her world. And she stopped trying new things, and she stopped exercising because she was afraid of it. And that led to her getting type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure and all sorts of other cascading problems that if she hadn't stopped exercising, maybe she wouldn't have. So it's a passion of mine, not just because it's great business, because as we saw in the previous slide, a lot of us have back pain, I want to try to help as many people not be in that situation as possible. So, just a quick disclaimer, this is not to help diagnose your pain. If you're sitting here and you're wondering what it is or why you have it, you probably should consult your doctor and get an actual diagnosis because very different um, prognosis means different treatment, right? And sometimes I was actually, I have a client who's a doctor, and he said, absolutely. There have been times people come in and they think that they have arthritis, and it turns out they have a tumor. Well, you probably don't have a tumor, okay? But you want to just make sure that you don't, right? You want to make sure you don't have a herniated disc before you start treating it just for muscle pain. So make sure that you know what it is that you're dealing with. Let me flip to my notes. I told Rebecca if I don't have notes that I'll just talk way too much. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's what we are going to cover. 
We're going to talk about the structure of the back and the purpose of the core muscles, improper technique, how it can do harm, and then of course, what do you do? Spine hygiene is a great term that covers, <coughs> excuse me, not just what you do in, the ex in your exercises, but all day long. You want to make sure you practice that so you can spare your spine. All right, who knows what the core is when we're talking about the body, right? I thought this was a great little, because it describes it's the middle, right? It's the core. Well, <coughs> um, let me flip. What is it? What part of the body? Anybody want to guess? Torso. The torso. I like that. That's perfect. I'll, oftentimes, I'll hear people say, the abs, they're part of it, but they're like the label on the soup can, you know, like you want the whole canister. So the entire torso and actually the glutes as well, not just the abdominals and the back muscles. Um, why do we have all these muscles here? To look good, right? No, I'm kidding. I, it does look good when you, those muscles are, are training. But quite often, have we ever been in the, uh, we've seen like the cover of the fitness magazine and it's somebody who's shirtless or in a bikini and they're like, get great core muscles. Well, she may or may not have a functioning core. I know she doesn't eat a lot of carbohydrates right before the photo shoot, but I don't know unless I see someone move if their core is healthy. Does that make sense? So it's a movement that really counts and how you control yourself in your body and space. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting over that thing that everybody's been getting, taking turns getting. So I apologize for my coughing. Okay, so here's where we have it. We have this beautifully elegant spine, and the nerves come out of these little foramen, these spaces in between, and they talk to our muscles and our brain and give us feedback and everything. So we don't want to mess that up. That system is really important, right? And you can see we have a cage, a rib cage, protecting our lungs and our heart and those organs. And we have weight-bearing bones here. But right here in this middle area where we have a lot of organs, we don't have any cage there. We don't have any protective bones there. So what do we have? We have layers and layers of muscle. So not just this really pretty muscle that everybody fixates on when they try to do their abs, right? We have really important muscles, obliques going crisscrossing this way for reinforcement and underneath all of that transverse abdominus. And in the back, we've got quadratus lumborum and we've got the lats and we've got glutes, right? I included the gluteal muscles because when they're doing their job, it sets everything above it up for success. So when everything's working together, it's like this really thick corset of muscle that holds everything in place. It takes the load off your spine and it protects your organs as well. So it's really important. Um, anything you wanna add? No? Okay, I'm doing all right. <laughs> okay, so then what goes wrong, right? We have so many activities in our modern life. I, you think back, great, great grandparents. My great, great grandmother was a pioneer woman in New Mexico before it was a state. So she would grind things and roll out dough and shovel and pickaxe and I mean she was using her core all the time. Sitting was not an option for this woman, right? And yes, people did hurt their backs, but their core muscles were strong. Usually it was because of accidents they hurt their backs. It wasn't usually because of modern day problems like <coughs> driving, sitting, activities or sedentary, mahjong, TV, you know. Um, the computer, the phone, how many Teenagers, do you see with bad posture already? And you're like, no, don't start now. So oftentimes, it's not, like we said, the singular event or what we do in the gym, right? It's how we spend so many hours of our day. I, I don't like that term, practice makes perfect, because perfect, what is that? Practice makes permanent. <laughs> Did he bring them? Do you, hello? Do you need me to use? It's not. Okay. I move better when I don't have to hold on my phone. I probably trip myself up. So, 
So oftentimes it's repetitive motion or how we spend most of our time that causes the problems that we experience in our back. So when we're in the gym, practice makes permanent. The exercise selection, what you choose to do, you want to address the imbalances that your life has created, right? So I don't know if you've ever seen this happen. A guy, usually it's a guy, but sometimes one, will come in and they have a desk job and they sit and they're going to come in the gym and they're going to spend 30 minutes on the bike. All right. And then they're going to go over to the bench press and they're going to bench press. And then they're going to go back to their job. Right? They haven't done anything to extend, to open up, to train those muscles that are, they have amnesia from how we spend our life. So that's what we want to focus on. If you don't, I just have a little uh, kind of progression. First, your muscles talk to you. They complain, right? Yes. They're stiff, they're tight, so what do you want to do? You want to stretch them. Oh my gosh, that feels so much better. But if you're not addressing why they're stiff, why they're doing more than their fair share of the work, you aren't really changing the problem. You're just alleviating a symptom. And then the next stage is, there's wear and tear on your discs. Delamination over time, it's like the layers of a tire truck, a truck tire coming off. And there are weak spots, and then you bend down to pick up your grandchild, and boom, your back goes out and you have a herniated disc. Or, if that isn't what happens, the wear and tear on your actual bony structures and the cartilage, and you end up with disc degeneration, you end up with arthritis, some, and, and a little arthritis is, I mean, it's kind of your badge of all your fun stuff you've done over the years, but you want to mitigate that. You want to try and control and not have too much, right? Okay. Oh, I do actually have an old credit card and I, I forgot to get it out of my bag. But have you ever bent, when you're getting rid of a credit card, have you ever bent it over and over again in the same spot? What happens eventually? It breaks. It breaks. And that's basically what happens to your disc. If you have a lot of pressure, you have that hydraulic pressure of bending here and picking up, instead of hinging here and picking up, we're going to demonstrate that later, that improper biomechanics or twisting. I had a 27-year-old that I used to train up in Napa who she had debilitating career-ending disability back problem because she was just picking and twisting. She was a law clerk, boom. And she was assigned to do this big project to go through all of their documents over the, a, a couple of weeks of doing that over and over again. And she just completely blew up, I guess, 27 years old. So it really matters what you do over and over again. And that you aren't putting undue pressure on these little structures that weren't meant to do that job. Okay. I'm almost done talking and then we get to play. We get to get up and move around and, and practice stuff, okay? So over the years, our understanding has changed how to train the body. How many of us remember when Arnold Schwarzenegger, before he was governor, right? He was the pumping iron bodybuilder and that whole craze, okay? Even before him, I mean, when you thought of strength training, you really, you thought of like the gym jocks and stuff like that, right? It wasn't necessarily, hadn't trickled out to the rest of us like it does now. Now we understand it's really important to strength train, but do you want to train like a bodybuilder? That's a very specific sport, you know? If you're going to stand on stage in a little speedo with a spray tan, then go for it. But if your goal is to make sure that you are pain-free and strong and can continue doing the activities you want to do, that's how you want to train. So we've moved from isolating muscles, and it's not totally bad. You know, you can talk to your trainer or a fitness professional about the difference. But you always want to make sure that you have movement patterns you're training. So your entire body is working because that's how you move in the real world. When you go to lift something out of the trunk of your car, you're not just using your arms, right? You have to use your legs, you have to use your core muscles, you have to use your shoulders, everything together. Um, and if I were to ask you to get out of your chair with using just one muscle, pick a muscle. Which one do you want to use? Nobody can do that, right? We all work, they all work together. So this is a really cool thing that I learned a few years ago from one of my favorite physical therapists, Ray Cook. He developed the movement system that I work with with my clients. And if you look at the human body, you have alternating 
mobility and stability joints. So your ankle and your foot, right? You want it to be super mobile so the muscles can do their job. And then what's above that? The knee. Well, okay, it bends, but you don't want it twisting and you don't want it going sideways. It's stable. What's the next joint? The hip. Ball and socket joint. Meant for lots of mobility, right? Okay, what's above that? Lumbar spine. If you look back at that slide, if I were to rewind, and we looked at the spine, they're different sizes, right? The vertebrae. The ones in your lumbar spine are really big and weight-bearing, and they're not meant to rotate more than about five degrees. Unlike the upper back, now we need mobility. So when you're doing your golf swing, you've got your hip and your upper back, but your low back doesn't get a lot of torque if you're doing it right. What's next to the upper back? The scapula. That's the bridge between your rib cage, your thoracic spine, and your arms. So it needs to be stable so that your shoulder, ball and socket joint, can be mobile. Isn't this cool? Did you ever think about this? Cool. So I just think that's really neat. But if one joint isn't doing its job, your ankle lacks mobility, then the next joint above it is going to suffer. And the hip is a really bad neighbor because the joints above it and below it suffer. So, you know, it's not working. Your knee and your back are going to hurt. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So he is one of my favorite, favorite, write his name down, take a picture, whatever. Stu McGill, Dr. Stu McGill. He is one of the foremost respected uh, physical therapists and doctors that are, he's written three books. One is for just the general population and two are for practitioners. Um, back mechanics, I think, was his first one. But, <coughs> pardon me. He is so fantastic, his protocol for helping back pain and preventing back pain. And he works with everybody from MMA fighters and power lifters, strongmen, to um, little ladies that have debilitating back pain. So one of the things that was really interesting is when we talk about training the core, what does your mind go to when you think of training your abs? What do you think of? Crunches. Crunches. Woo! Okay, so it's not necessarily that crunches are horrible, but they're really not the best way to train function for your core, for what we're talking about. And actually, in his lab, they took a cadaver spine and then just did flexion over and over and over again, replicating what happens in a crunch and they actually caused a herniated disc between L4 and L5, which is the most common area to have back problems, right? So that's when he started going, hey, what if we take crunches out of our training protocol? And what he noticed with all of the athletes he worked with, and I noticed this because, of course, when I hear something, I'm like, well, I'm going to be a guinea pig and I'm going to do it for myself and all my clients. In 2010, I heard him speak, and he said this. So for 2010, the whole year, I didn't do a single abdominal crunch. I just did plank, side planks, stuff like that, anti-rotation. And then I, the next year, I actually performed better on a sit-up test. How is that possible? I strengthened the muscles in the way they're meant to be used, so they were available for me in that test, but you don't want to train to the test. You don't want to train that movement, with that flexion movement too much. Does that make sense? Okay. If it do doesn't, just go, no. No. <laughs> okay. So I love this, this quote, exercises are tools to get specific jobs done. The way an exercise is performed depends on the rationale for choosing that exercise. So remember what I was talking about? If your life has you here, your exercise program has to return you to here, right? First, list the objective. Why am I doing this exercise? What is it for? And then decide on the best tool, the best way to get that job done. Usually the best exercise is the one that creates the largest effect and spares uh, with minimal risk to the joints, right? So that's what we're looking for. Okay, so what do we do instead? We're almost to the fun part. We want to focus on how an exercise feels rather than how it looks. As Rebecca and I are going through, and we're going to have handouts for you to take home, we took pictures to jog your memory so you remember, oh, that's what a side plank looks like. But the problem with pictures is sometimes we try to copy what that looks like. And all of us, would you agree, looking around the room, we're all shaped a little bit different. Okay. And our skeletal structures are a little bit different. So your neutral spine and my neutral spine might look different. So you want to focus on 
when you're in the proper position, do you feel those muscles working? Now, sometimes you might not feel the first time you do a plank properly. People go, oh, I don't feel my abs. And I'll poke, and I'm like, well, they're working. And the next day, you'll feel your abs. So <laughs> then do it again, and you'll be like, oh, that's right. OK, that's where those are. So just have faith. You'll find them. Secondly, reflexive exercises are good. What is a reflexive exercise? A reflexive exercise is a position that we put you in where gravity is doing its job, and if you're <coughs> holding the position, the right muscles are working. So we've chosen those in our core strengthening exercises that we've given you. When you put your body in the proper posture against gravity, the right muscles are working, and you don't necessarily have to think about it. Now, it's not a problem if you're doing an exercise where you're thinking about contracting that you know, transverse abdominus muscle, that's okay. But you want to have a mixture of those exercises. You want to have some reflexive exercises in there because then, remember, practice makes permanent, right? Then when you're not thinking about it and you lose your balance or someone bumps into you or something and you right yourself and you hold your core, it's reflexive, right? Okay, three. Oh, I already did that one. Um, and then once you have all of this in place, so remember, move well before you move more. Simplify your core work. Oftentimes I see people, because they found the right exercise on YouTube or something, or they went to a class. Now, here we have some wonderful instructors in our classes. So if you let them know you have back pain, or they you usually can see when you're doing it a little bit wrong, you'll be corrected, you'll be given a modification. Um, but if you're working out on your own, you want to make sure that you start with the easiest version and really make that work for you. Too often, we're so bored or excited to progress, we want to jump to, oh, well, let's see if I could do that one leg. Let's see if I could do that moving one. And now, all of a sudden, the wrong muscles are taking over. Your body's very smart. It will figure out how to get the job done to your detriment, <laughs> right? So you want to make sure you simplify and just really focus on the details, getting that right. Then, work, so we're working on stability. Mobility, what is mobility? It's flexibility with motor control. The ability to control your body in space, right? So it kind of takes stability and blends it together with flexibility. So you do want to work on flexibility, but then you want to go, oh, okay, can I do that? And balance, right? and still keep my core in the right position. Increase your strength once you do these steps. These have to be in place, and then we load it, right? Because now the little table isn't wobbly anymore, it's stable. We can put the heavy base on it. And aquatic exercise is always the right thing to do. If you have back pain or you want to avoid back pain, incorporating aquatic exercise into your program is so spine sparing. If you hate swimming, I'm trying to like swimming because I know it's really good for me, but I don't like getting my blonde hair in the chlorine and then having to, like, you know, turns green, people. So um, I have discovered, I just put it up and then get in the deep end with the floaty belt on, and you can run, and it feels like you're running. Any runners in here or past runners? Okay. And your doctor has said, you probably shouldn't run so much. Yeah. I promise you, if you do this, it almost, it's like the same kind of runner's high. It feels so good, but then you're not having those compressive forces on your joints, on your spine. So even if you replace two of your runs with deep water running, if you are still able to run, you know, that would be a great way to make sure you're not, that, that you are cross-training. The other benefit of aquatic exercise is that you literally can't move. Has anybody ever tried to chase someone in the water? <laughs> and you're like pushing against that force. What are you using? Your core. Your core. So you, you can't move in the water unless you're using your core. Again, simplify just like the core work I said. When you're in the water, the faster you move and the harder you push, the more force the water pushes back on you. So just be aware that maybe if it's your first couple of times, Take it slow, because you don't realize how tired you are until you get out of the water. Has anybody ever experienced that? Like, this isn't very hard, and then you get out, and you're like, oh my gosh, gravity, because you are two-thirds lighter. 
in the water than you are in land. So, okay, are we ready to have some fun? Just remember to pay attention to what works for you. Always remember that you are unique. And so <coughs> if you have pain when you do hyperextension, modify that. Or, you know, if you don't know how, you can ask us at the end and we'll give you some options. Pay attention to what hurts. We'll be presenting right now some um, exercises and stretches. If you know in your mind, oh yeah, I could, no, that's not going to work for me, then respect that. But there are always options, okay? So if we present anything that you're thinking is not possible for you, remember we can give you modifications. All right? All right? All right. You ready? Yeah. Let's get started. <laughs> so not only will we, as Susan said, talking about things that we should try to incorporate into our workout, but we're going to give you a few exercises that you might be doing that you might not want to do anymore. <laughs> Um, so the first thing is finding your neutral spine. So you can see in the picture here, and as Susan said, we all have our own neutral spine, but you've probably seen um, a lot of variations of spinal erectness um, as you walk around this world. A lot of us are here, and a lot of us are here. It depends on where your tightness and your weakness are. But where we're looking to bring you is to this spot where we're stacking. Our hips are under our rib cage, our rib cage is under our shoulders, our shoulders are under the head, very heavy head. If we bring it forward, it starts to pull everything along with it. And that's not just standing. We want to find our neutral spine in all the positions we find ourselves in. So if we're standing, like we just described, if we're sitting, you know, at your computer or driving, we're not here. So there's some ergonomic steps you can take to, you know, make your computer easier to look at. <laughs> you don't want to sit on your tailbone. You want to sit on your ischial tuberosities. You want to sit on the tops of your thighs, right here. So right now, everybody, to pre let's practice this. Yeah. Go ahead and scoot maybe to the, scoot your booty all the way to the back, that little hole in the chair, and then roll those shoulders back and down. Except if you're short, scoot forward. Oh, you can scoot forward, yeah, if you're short like, if you're short, 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 you can sit on the edge of the chair. <laughs> but see how you're still supported in this in the chair, and now your spine is up. And look at what automatically happened to your neck. Isn't that awesome? And okay. most of you gained at least an inch. So if for no other reason, that inch. And it makes you look a lot more excited about what we're talking about. <laughs> All right. So to get into neutral spine, these uh, <coughs> transverse abdominal muscles are. Uh, some of the more important ones. They're the ones that naturally hold our core into place. And just like any other muscle group, if you don't make it work for you, it's going to relax and kind of take it easy over time. So then it's not really holding our spines up. But if we start to engage it, it will lengthen us up and create space. So this is the one that's like a corset. It wraps around us. The fibers actually run around horizontally. So it's like a corset. And um, so we want to use these to pull in and not crunch. So it's more of a hugging feeling. I think the next one is hugging versus bearing down. So <coughs> if you're doing abdominal exercises and you feel yourself pushing out, we can all try this for a second. Yeah. So if you're engaging your abs, you don't want to engage them so that they're pushing out. You want to engage them so they're Hugging in. Yeah. And it's not a bikini suck in. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's yeah. more of like someone's going to punch you in the stomach. I yeah. won't. Don't worry. I won't come around and punch you. But if you just yeah. kind of poke yourself. With a yeah. lightness, too. Yeah. So this is something you can practice over time because the challenge is then, well, wait a second. Do I have to breathe still? Because now <laughs> I'm holding in. So you want to be able to start lightly, like Susan was saying, start with a gentle exercise. These transverse, if you haven't addressed them in a while, you want to start with a, just a light hug. So a class that we have here is this class I teach on Tuesdays at 10.15. We work on the transverse in this class quite often with just gentle squeezing exercises. And um, you can do this on your own, just hugging in lightly over time, working to squeeze a little bit more and a little bit more. It's helpful to make little reminders for yourself. Um, 
at your workstation, your kitchen, your bathroom mirror, put little post-it notes saying, tall torso. That's <laughs> hugging in. Yeah. Um, it will, because you'll be amazed if you haven't been using these muscles, how fatigued they get, and then it's so quickly you lose it again. Yeah. So you have to keep reminding yourself throughout the day. So you can see here, let me use this pointer, do, 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 they run all the way down to the pubic bone, up to the rib cage. So, yeah, up to the sternum, right here in the middle. And so, just sitting tall, sit back up, some of us have lost our... <laughs> that inch. So take that inch back, now just run your fingers down from the top of your rib cage, or the bottom of your rib cage, down, all the way down, and if you have a hard time sensing what's behind your fingers, what's behind your skin, then this hugging exercise will help you to bring some more awareness to that area. Heightening your awareness and your ability to sense these areas will be the first thing you want to do. So just down and hugging. You can leave. I like to ask people to use their fingers on the outside so that you can more easily get your brain into that area because it's hard to just feel randomly. Okay, where am I going? What am I squeezing? Use your fingers and all the way out to your pelvis, the hip bones here, wide and low. All right. So this cat cow stretch is a great one to work on finding your um, your neutral spine. We need to stretch a few things in the body to help us get to that neutral spine. Uh, this is going to help us stretch the back and maybe get some awareness on if we're normally here, how do we stretch the front of the body without too much weight on it. So standing can sometimes be challenging if you have some pain, but hands and knees is sometimes a little more comfortable. And then the same thing if you're normally here, where are you engaging to go the opposite direction? Mm -hmm. And you might go, wait, isn't this spinal flexion? Didn't you tell us this was bad for us? This isn't weighted. You're not using your muscles to create this necessarily. I mean, it's, it's unweighted. And so it doesn't do the damage to your discs that like an ab crunch holding a weight ball would yeah. do. Okay. And also the quality of movement is important here as well. So if you're, if you're doing a fast cat cow really fast, it can be very jarring on your, on your bones, on mm -hmm. your discs. And That's also terrible. going as deep as you possibly can can be jarring as well. So I like to think I'm, when I'm teaching yoga or other stretch classes, I encourage people to try to keep space on the top and the bottom side of the spine. So you can see here, there's a potential right in this area here for there to be some crunching and some shortening, some compression. But if you're doing it well, you're still creating space here. You're still looking for that length. And then the same thing here, there's potential for crunching the spine on the front side of the body. So you want to keep that space. It should always be spacious movement without compression. All right. Questions? Okay. We're going to do it. Yeah. Oh, another area to look out for, too, is right here. So our low back and the neck 